front row risky. But. Well, thank you so much for coming, and uh, good afternoon. It's my privilege to welcome you today to this year's William R. Stewart Memorial Lecture for Labor and Employment Law. Um, you know, one of my, the best things about my job is to be able to welcome the tremendous scholars that we're able to bring in for these endowed lectures. And today, we're really lucky to have one of the nation's rising stars in the employment labor law area, uh, Professor Charlotte Garden. My job is to do just a quick introduction on the Stewart Lecture, and then I'm turn, going to turn it over uh, to uh, Professor Dale Schmidt, who will do an introduction of the speaker. Um, this lecture was established in 2006, and it honors the late Bill Stewart, who was one of our most distinguished graduates, a veteran of the United States Army. He earned his JD here in 1959. Forty years later, he was inducted into the school's Academy of Law Alumni Fellows, which is the highest and most distinguished honor our school can bestow upon one of our graduates. Uh, for 34 years, he was a lawyer with the National Labor Relations Board and was the board's first African-American chief counsel. His leadership and commitment to excellence prompted President Bill Clinton to award the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service and to characterize his contributions to the NLRB as, quote, unparalleled. At the time, he was the first and only NLRB employee in its entire 69-year history to receive this honor, the highest honor that any civil servant can receive. Past Stewart lectures have been some of the most prominent labor and employment law scholars in the nation. They include Laura Cooper from the University of Minnesota, Martin Malin from the Chicago Kent College of Law, Matt Finken from the University of Illinois, Sam Bagansos from Michigan Law, Cynthia Eslin from NYU, and last year, Professor Stephen Befort from Minnesota. This year, we're very pleased to add to this illustrious list. Professor Dale Schmidt will now join us to introduce Professor Garden. Thank you. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Professor Garden today. I think the first time we ever met was at a conference on labor and employment law at the University of Wisconsin, and it was about eight years ago when she was first uh, entering the academy, and, and uh, she was such a, uh, such a, a bright and well-read and just a wonderful person that you knew that Professor Garden uh, would be a, a fertile uh, scholar. And uh, that has proven uh, true over the time, over time. Uh, she's an expert in labor uh, and work law. Uh, she looks primarily at the intersection of uh, work and labor law with constitutional law, as she will discuss today. Uh, she's published in a number of uh, important journals, including Emory, Boston University, George Washington Law Review, Fordham, William and Mary, the Harvard Civil Rights and Civil Liberties uh, Law Review. Uh, she also regularly uh, writes opinion and analysis pieces for a variety of, of blogs and, and also for, for uh, um, Papers. Her work has, has appeared on the SCOTUS blog and at Salon. Uh, she's also appeared in the uh, New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, but in addition to that, she stays active in practice writing a amici brief. And she is often generous enough to include me in on these briefs. And she's written some very important ones in labor and employment law, uh, um, certainly uh, Friedrichs uh, versus California Teachers Association, the Tackett case, Harris v. Quinn, uh, important am amica there. Uh, she, uh, she practiced for eight years before uh, going into the academy, including she clerked for Judge uh, Thomas Ambro in the Third Circuit, and she also uh, did a uh, three-year uh, stint as an associate with the union-side union labor law firm of Breedoff and Kaiser, which is one of the premier labor law firms in the country. And today, uh, we're very pleased to have her uh, talk to us. Uh, you've probably, if you, unless you've been living in a cave, you heard about the recent Janus case before the Supreme Court. And she is going to speak about uh, speech inequality after Janus versus Ask Me. And she's going to address uh, kind of the growing disconnect between how uh, corporations are allowed to use market power to gain First Amendment uh, access and the way that uh, unions have been treated uh, by the Supreme Court. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Garden uh, to give this great lecture. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I am really delighted to be here, and I especially want to thank uh, the dean and also professors uh, Dauschmidt and Wittes for the invitation, and of course also the Stewart family. Um, I'm so grateful to be here to talk about Janice V. Afsme, um, and the First Amendment with all of you. So on June 27th of this year, uh, two things with ongoing ramifications for money in politics and for the state of American democracy more generally happened. Uh, the Supreme Court decided Janice V. Afsme, and also Justice Kennedy retired. 
Uh, in a way, it's fitting that those two events came to pass on the same day. Justice Kennedy wasn't the leader of the charge to hold uh, that public sector workers can't be required to pay union dues or fees to the union that represents them, right? That was Justice Alito. But Justice Kennedy was the leading architect of the theories that, as Justice Kagan warned in her Janus dissent, have turned the First Amendment into a sword that could be used against workaday economic and regulatory policy. As Justice Kagan warned, Janus will have a range of consequences for workers, unions, for American politics and society more generally. Uh, for one, Janus will make it more difficult for workers to make themselves heard in the political process, uh, exacerbating the state of affairs in which political influence is wielded by a relatively small group of wealthy spenders, and politicians are essentially non-responsive to their low-income constituents, um, as some researchers have found. Uh, we might think of this problem uh, of uh, the problem of unequal access to political spending and therefore political influence as a form of speech inequality. Of course, we mostly have the same formal rights to speak and to participate in politics, um, but the practical ability to be heard and to elicit a response from your elected leaders is highly dependent on either individual or corporate wealth or the ability to aggregate, right, to collectivize, um, to work together with others, to pool resources in an organization such as a labor union. But again, those opportunities are not distributed equally, and part of the reason for that is the growing divergence between the way the court treats union participation in politics as compared to how it treats participation by wealthy individuals or by corporations. So Janus, which I'll talk about in some more detail shortly, uh, is just the latest chapter in this story. Uh, to see how we got to Janus, it helps to go back to the beginning. So I'm going to give a short history of the law of union dues. Um, I know that may not sound like the most riveting thing you've ever heard, but hopefully I'll convince you. Um, so a short history of union dues and fees as that law developed before Janus, uh, and then talk about where the weaponized First Amendment is likely to go next. So the historian Laura Weinrib has described how the weaponization of the First Amendment that Justice Kagan referred to began shortly after the end of the Lochner era, which if you have not taken con law yet, you will know about soon. Uh, during that era, uh, or just after that era, business interests were confronted with the loss of the Due Process Clause as a useful deregulatory tool. In response, Weinrib shows, they began to focus on creative uses of the First Amendment instead. So around the early 1940s, when Justice Black wrote that the First Amendment was essential to the poorly financed causes of little people, the more well-heeled set was also starting to consider how to turn objections to the regulation of work, including the obligation to bargain collectively with labor unions, into free speech fights. That's also when the Hollywood director, Cecil B. DeMille, uh, helped coin the phrase right to work, framing objections to paying for union representation in terms of the little guy, right, squaring off against big labor with its political agenda, and absenting the coercive power that employers wield and that unions oppose from that, co from that equation altogether. The so-called right to work question, um, I'm not gonna do air quotes every time, just do it the first time. <laughs> The right to work question soon made it to the Supreme Court in a 1956 case involving private sector railway workers uh, whose unions were newly authorized by Congress to negotiate union shop agreements uh, in which every worker was contractually obligated to join the union that represented them. That amendment responded to an earlier Supreme Court case that held that railway unions had to fairly represent every worker in a bargaining unit for whom they were ex the exclusive representative. That duty of fair representation was an entirely necessary corrective, which put an end to the practice of unions claiming the exclusive authority to represent African American workers in bargaining with their employers, but simultaneously excluding those workers from union membership or a say in how the union operated. But the combination of exclusive representation and that duty of fair representation also incidentally created a collective action problem. Once a union was elected, workers would be entitled to receive the same representation services whether or not they paid dues or fees. Um, and so accordingly, right, Congress responded, putting into the law a policy that those who enjoy the fruits and benefits of the unions should be required to make a fair contribution in support of those unions. In other words, if unions are going to be required to treat workers equally, it made sense to also allow them to negotiate for agreements <laughs> under which represented workers would be obligated to join the union, right, or seek employment elsewhere. 
In the Supreme Court, union represented railway workers uh, objected to unions using their market power to require this choice between paying for union representation and finding another job. The court disagreed. Uh, it held that union security clauses were not, unco not unconstitutional on their face, but it also left the door open to future challenges in which plaintiffs could attempt to show that compulsory membership was being used to impair their freedom of expression. The court there was referring to the employee's own expression. Um, for example, uh, union policies that excluded from membership, right, and therefore from work, employees who publicly held political positions or belonged to political parties that were different from their union's positions or preferred parties. So the main type of claim the court was signaling that it was open to in the future was focused on unions that actually constrained represented employees through substantive membership conditions, rather than claims that the unions themselves were engaged in their own political advocacy using union dues, but that changes. So five years later, another case reaches the court. Again, it involves railway workers uh, who are arguing that they have a constitutional right not to pay union dues because their unions spend a portion of those dues on, campaign, on campaigning. This time the court used the constitutional avoidance canon uh, to construe the Railway Labor Act to permit unions and employers to require workers to cover their share of costs of union representation, but not the union's other activities, right, including politics. So that portion that uh, employees could be required to contractually obligated to pay is known as the agency fee, right, because it's the amount of money uh, required for the union to serve as the agent for the employee. So, if you're following along at this point, uh, we have one opinion finding that union security clauses don't violate the First Amendment on their face, and another saying that at most the Constitution precludes unions from spending workers' dues on politics, but remember, that's a constitutional avoidance decision, so perhaps that carve-out was not constitutionally required or wouldn't be constitutionally required. So given the state of play, right, you might be surprised to learn that 15 years later, the court wrote in its 1977 decision, Abood v. Detroit Board of Education, that the two earlier Railway Labor Act cases actually stood for the proposition that the First Amendment is implicated by an arrangement requiring public sector workers to pay a fee covering their share of costs of union representation. And thus, right, thus it was that the constitutional principle that compelled subsidization of a private entity's speech implicates the First Amendment was born into the world, not with a bang, right, but with an overreading of statutory precedent in a new constitutional context. To be clear, right, the Abood Court went on to hold that agency fees were justified, right, were still justified by the government's interest in labor peace and its related interest in preventing free riding. That idea is rooted in the collective action problem that results when unions have to represent everyone fairly in a bargaining unit whether or not they join. Right? Given that workers are entitled to their union's bargaining and grievance representation services whether or not they pay dues, the economically rational decision is not to pay. Right? Furthermore, to hope that your coworkers all do pay right? to keep the union afloat. Um, but then nobody wants to be a sucker and so if you see your colleagues making the decision, decision to free ride, you might also decide to free ride. The result is a vicious cycle in which more and more workers defect, ultimately leaving the union underfunded and unable to do a good job on behalf of the workers it represents, a further reason, right, that one might decide not to pay dues anymore. That dynamic in itself could be undesirable for public sector employers that have made the decision to rely on collective bargaining to set terms and conditions of employment for workers, but there are two other reasons to connect this idea of labor peace with agency fees. First, a number of states adopted public sector collective bargaining in response to strikes and other disruption by public sector workers in the 60s and 70s. Just like we recently saw in West Virginia and other red states earlier this summer, right, public sector workers are fully capable of waging illegal strikes and public sector strikes can come in waves. So some states concluded that they would be better off uh, if they created a system whereby every three years or so, they would hear from their employees in collective bargaining about what they wanted at work and come up with some sort of reasonable compromise. In other words, these states set up their systems of collective bargaining in part to give employees a predictable channel to exercise collective voice in order to discourage strikes. But if their unions broke down due to underfunding and couldn't effectively form this voice channeling function, then the employers might predict that their workers would go back to self-help. Second, 
Some states wanted unions to be able to charge agency fees because they wanted to limit the extent to which employees could resign from paying union dues in response to things like the union refusing to take a frivolous grievance um, to arbitration. So in other words, some states thought that a right to work system could actually end up making unions more militant and they wanted to avoid that by giving unions a certain measure of autonomy. So perhaps the court thought that recognizing this labor peace rationale and arriving at kind of a compromise outcome in Abood, um, which was focused on these labor peace and free riding concerns, would prove stable right, and settle questions about the so-called right to work in the public sector. And for a while, that is more or less what happened. From 1977 until 2012, the Abood Compromise mostly held. I'm skipping here, you'll be glad to hear, a series of cases that resulted in the board uh, building up the procedures that had to be in place to protect uh, union represented workers, um, and also cases that excluded particular union activities from the list of what unions could charge for. Um, but those cases didn't undermine, and in fact, many of them uh, reinforced Abood's basic reasoning and fundamental outcome. Okay, so I want to pause here to situate Abood in another line of cases before I talk about Abood's undoing. We mostly think about Abood as a union case. Maybe we think about it as a compelled subsidization of speech case, but it wouldn't be unreasonable to also think about it as a money and politics case. After all, the represented workers who want to opt out of union dues or fees often cite as their first reason for wanting to opt out the fact that the union represent, that represents them also supports disagreeable candidates or other political positions. Furthermore, unions' participation in politics on behalf of mostly Democratic candidates helps explain why it is that agency fee cases have been and continue to be pursued so hotly by the well-funded pillars of the conservative labor movement. Uh, sorry, conservative legal movement. One study found that going from an agency shop regime to a right to work regime reduces Democratic presidential vote share by 3.5 percentage points, right? So it's easy to see the real world consequences here. But in one case, uh, Abu directly intersected with an evolving line of campaign finance cases. So in the 1990 case, Austin v. Michigan Chamber of Commerce, a divided court upheld a Michigan law that banned corporations from making independent political expenditures on behalf of candidates in state campaigns. More specifically, the court held that although the independent expenditure ban implicated corporate free speech rights, it was nonetheless justified because of the, quote, corrosive and distorting effects of immense aggregations of wealth that are accumulated with the help of the corporate form and that have little or no correlation to the public support for the corporation's political ideas. In other words, right, Michigan could restrict corporate independent expenditures because of the risk that rich corporations would use the benefit of the corporate form to drown out other political messages, right, to the detriment of voters who might be listening, right, to the detriment of the polity. Or to use a flawed but common free speech metaphor, the state could take steps to protect competition in the marketplace of ideas uh, to increase the chances that appealing but undercapitalized ideas or candidates could gain market share. Secondarily, the Austin court considered the argument um, that sounds pretty similar to the one the workers were advancing in Austin and other, or in Abood and other union dues cases, um, that Michigan's law would prevent shareholders from having what they think of as their money uh, funneled towards disagreeable political advocacy. The other key feature of Michigan's law is that it didn't apply to unions. So unions could use their general treasury funds on independent political ads. The court observed, though, that it made sense for Michigan to treat unions differently than corporations um, because of a boot. So it was reasonable, the court thought, to let unions use these general, tre general treasury funds on political ads because represented workers could still receive union services even if they decided not to pay for the union's political advocacy. And therefore, unions didn't have the same ability to leverage their market position uh, to inflate their campaign spending right through their non-politics related uh, work representation of workers. So this isn't to say that the court thought that 
the legislature had to exclude unions from the independent expenditure ban. But the key is that legislatures could make their own decisions um, aimed at achieving a more level electoral playing field, including by limited, limiting the extent to which economic influence could be leveraged to yield political influence. And further, legislatures could account for different legal regimes that applied to corporations and unions in assessing the degree of leverage that each could bring to bear on their respective constituencies. Okay, so if what I just said about government authority to regulate political speech marketplaces doesn't really sound right to you, well, you have definitely been paying attention to the Roberts Court. Uh, the Roberts Court has taken a decidedly different approach to the relationship between money and speech. Uh, there are all sorts of deregulatory First Amendment cases that we could talk about as examples here. So one recent study found that nearly half of First Amendment cases in the federal appellate courts now benefit businesses and trade groups. And another study found that the Roberts Court is much friendlier to business than either the Berger or Rehnquist courts. And if you want one fact that sums up the shift from the Berger or the Rehnquist courts to the Roberts court, kind of in a nutshell, I invite you to consider that Abood, right, the case that unions unsuccessfully sought to defend in Janus, was a case that the unions lost. Right? The unions in Abood were defending the position that public sector workers could be required to pay full union dues, right, a position the court rejected. Similarly, the watershed campaign finance case, uh, Buckley v. Vallejo, which came out uh, a year before Abood, was heartily criticized at the time by proponents of campaign finance reform, some of whom now find themselves in the position of having to defend the contribution and disclosure limits that Buckley left in place. But in particular, three First Amendment campaign finance cases, I think really uh, illustrate and distill the extent to which the Roberts Court has retreated from Austin's understanding of the world. Of course, they're Citizens United, right, which formally overruled Austin to hold that corporations and unions can spend unlimited general treasury funds on independent political ads. Citizens United emphasized that legislatures couldn't discriminate against corporate speakers, including in order to protect dissenting shareholders. And they could not attempt to iron out distortions in the market by restricting political spending based on the speaker's use of a state-conferred benefit, right there, the corporate form, in order to accumulate money that they then use to buy political speech. But in two other cases, decided in 2008 and 2011, the court also ruled off limits to legislatures two other methods of leveling the electoral playing field. One was something called the Millionaire's Amendment, uh, which allowed federal candidates to accept larger campaign contributions when they were running against a candidate who self-financed their campaign to the tune of more than $350,000. The other was a public financing scheme that made more money available to publicly financed candidates when their, when their privately financed opponents raised over a certain dollar amount. In both of those cases, the court held that the First Amendment was implicated when spending on speech could trigger a fundraising boost for a political opponent. So the court characterized the Millionaire's Amendment as an unprecedented penalty on any candidate who robustly exercises his First Amendment rights. Like in Citizens United, right, which was decided right in the middle of those two cases in 2010, the court emphasized that leveling the playing field not only wasn't a compelling government interest that could justify the two laws, but it wasn't even a legitimate government interest. So the marketplace of ideas became a much more laissez-faire place, right, replacing Austin's more regulated uh, political speech marketplace, in which the government could both take steps to prevent the emergence of oligopolistic speakers, uh, oligopolistic speakers, and could consider whether political spending by enterprises might make associated individuals, right, shareholders, maybe even employees, reasonably feel that their own speech was implicated. So looking at the shift from Austin to Citizens United and the other Roberts Court campaign finance cases might lead us to expect that the court would overrule Abood, but not by holding that it was unconstitutional to require employees to pay agency fees as a condition of employment. Instead, we might expect that the court would hold that just as corporations can use their market leverage to enhance their own spending on politics, so can unions. And what is unions economic leverage? Well, it's the ability to arrive at a contract that includes a union security provision, right? giving people a choice between leaving their jobs and paying dues. If you don't like that analogy in the public sector because of the role of the government as employer, first, your quibble might really be with a longer line of cases that curtail the First Amendment rights of employees, but at least, or public sector employees, 
But at least you might agree with me um, about the private sector, right? After all, remember that the court interpreted the Railway Labor Act to disallow union shop agreements in order to pre uh, prevent workers from having to make that choice between paying for union political advocacy and staying in their jobs. And the court later interpreted the National Labor Relations Act in the same way. So that rule just seems inconsistent, right, with the laissez-faire approach of the Roberts Court campaign finance cases. But as you know, that is not how things worked out. Instead, the Roberts Court union fees cases went in the opposite direction, beginning in 2012 when the court decided a case called Knox v. SEIU Local 1000. Uh, I won't bore you with the details of Knox, which really began its life as one of the less interesting cases on the docket. Um, but the decision sent out uh, whatever the conservative legal movement uses in place of a bat signal um, for two reasons. So first, Justice Alito called the Abood Compromise a First Amendment quote unquote anomaly, which maybe sounds kind of mild, but in the um, world of the Supreme Court is sort of like calling something fake news, right? And second, the court majority gave union objectors more than they asked for um, by adopting a rule that nobody had briefed or even suggested. That rule was that when the union wants to raise dues mid-year, it has to obtain affirmative consent from agency fee payers um, rather than assuming that they'll pay unless they opt out. Right, so the court holds that, the that as a matter of constitutional law, right, we need an opt-out default rather than an opt-in default. Um, just for mid-year dues increases so far. So that idea, right, that unions actually owe a duty to help individuals exercise their right not to speak was entirely new. In fact, government often encourages individuals to waive their constitutional rights, right, and that is not thought in other contexts to raise constitutional objections except in some fairly limited circumstances. Okay, in response to that new rule, right, seeing the writing on the wall, objectors filed a large number of new cases asking the court to overrule Abood and also to declare other aspects of public sector labor relations unconstitutional. The first of those cases to reach the Supreme Court was Harris v. Quinn, which the court decided in 2014. Uh, in Harris, the court struck down agency fees in the context of what the court called partial public employees. That is a label that is not really salient outside of the agent, uh, agency fee context. I would not expect you to have heard it in your employment law classes. But partial public employees in this context are uh, people who work for individuals, for example, as home health care aides, uh, but who are paid through Medicaid, right? And therefore some of their working conditions are set by a public entity, right, are set by a state. So a list of states began allowing these workers to unionize and bargain collectively, not with the individuals they serve, right, not with their clients, um, but with the state over the working conditions and wages that the state set. Um, those laws also generally allowed these workers to negotiate an agency fee, or the unions representing these workers to negotiate an agency fee. So the court in Harris held that Abood's labor peace rationale right, was a poor fit for these workers because they were unlikely to engage in labor disruption. Right? They're working in individual homes all over the state. Right? The court says, well, they're unlikely to be able to engage in the coordinated action that they would need to do to go out on strike or something like that. That is an ahistorical view of these workers, um, likely grounded in assumptions about who home health care workers are likely to be, right? But there you go. The upshot for now is that the court distinguished a boot rather than overruling it. That fact made unions temporarily optimistic that the court didn't have five votes to overturn a boot. I said that in a number of public fora, showing that I am very good at making Supreme Court predictions, and you should definitely listen to me when I do that. Um, <laughs> All of, those, all of those predictions were quickly dashed when the court granted cert a year later in Friedrichs v. California Teachers Association. Friedrichs squarely presented the Abood issue, um, and oral argument made it fairly clear to all interested observers that the court had five votes to overturn Abood. However, Justice Scalia, right, he was the possible swing vote in these cases rather than Justice Kennedy, um, died before the court could issue its decision, resulting in a 4-4 split that left Abood in place. So that brings us to Janice v. AFSCME. I'm skipping the whole election thing that happened in between. But <laughs> move on, moving on. Janice came out of Illinois, and it again presented squarely the issue of whether traditional public employees could be required to pay agency fees. As you know, right, the court reversed a boot, 
In addition, the court extended the holding from Knox, ruling that unions have to obtain affirmative consent before they can charge any money from non-members. So whereas Abood uh, relied on this interest in labor peace and stability in upholding agency fees, the Janus Court held that the fact that about half of states in the federal government did not allow public sector uh, unions to collect agency fees showed that labor peace could be obtained in other ways. Likewise, the court said that states couldn't rely on an interest in preventing free riding, um, more or less because the state could just force unions to represent non-paying workers for free anyway. And the court rejected other reasons for retaining a boot as well, including that it was uh, consistent with the original understanding of the Constitution, um, that it was consistent with other cases about the scope of employees' free speech rights in the public sector, um, and stare decisis. One theme, though, that runs through Justice Alito's opinion in Janus, like his opinions in Knox and Harris, uh, is that public sector unions are essentially parasitic on the First Amendment rights of workers, rather than being speakers whose own rights to engage in political advocacy should also be considered. So whereas cases, uh, in cases like Citizens United, the court was concerned that Congress burdened corporate rights by forcing corporations to create a political action committee in order to engage in independent political advocacy, the Janus Court was not terribly concerned about placing procedural burdens on unions that want to use member dues to do the same thing. Remember, right after Abood, the rule was that unions could spend member dues but not non-member agency fees on politics, right? After Janus, Unions have a legal obligation to first use those member dues to fund representation of non-members, right, to whom the union owes a duty of fair representation. Only once the union has done that can it use its remaining money, right, its remaining dues money, on politics and other non-representational activities, right, like new organizing. Um, it's unimaginable, right, that the court would approve a rule requiring corporations to perform some sort of public duty as a prerequisite to engaging in politics as a condition of issuing a corporate charter, but that is essentially what the Janus Court held was required of unions. Also absent from Janus is attention to the First Amendment rights of public sector employees who have chosen uh, not just union representation, but to contribute to their union's political advocacy by becoming full dues-paying members. If we accept the logic of the rule uh, against compelled subsidization of speech, right, which asks us to treat union dues and fees as being sort of tied to the workers who paid them, um, even after they've been transmitted to the union that intends to spend them on politics, then we can trace the obligation to subsidizing free riding workers from the union back to its members, right, who have their own political advocacy diminished in a right to work regime. Of course, those workers could also choose to free ride, right? And they could divert the money that they would otherwise spend on union dues to politics. Uh, but that means choosing between weakening their association with their union as their workplace representative um, and engaging in political advocacy themselves. So you might be thinking now that the solution to all this is just to get rid of the duty of fair representation and or the exclusive representation system. After all, right, those are the parts of the labor relations regime that make the logic of the agency fee compelling. Uh, the Janus majority had a couple of things to say about this, in fact. First, it suggested that states could not simply eliminate the duty of fair representation, at least not for unions that are <laughs> exclusive representatives. We are likely to see how far the court intends to take that statement um, because New York State reacted to Janus by altering the scope of the duty of fair representation to excuse unions from representing non-members in certain disciplinary proceedings. Under the New York law, unions still have to represent workers fairly in bargaining and grievances, right, but they don't need to provide uh, representation that they provide to dues-paying members when the state moves to fire a worker for misconduct. Second, states could eliminate the exclusive representation system. In fact, the Janus Court invited cases arguing that exclusive representation is unconstitutional, right? Justice Alito wrote that designating a union as the exclusive representative of non-members substantially restricts the non-members' rights. Perhaps an even more clear statement, right, of Justice Alito's thinking than calling a boot an anomaly. So, there were already, before Janus came along, cases arguing that exclusive representation is unconstitutional. In fact, the lawyers in Harris v. Quinn had briefed the argument that exclusive representation is unconstitutional, though at the time, several justices seemed skeptical. 
But now, right, likely in response to Justice Alito's signal, there are many more of these cases at the district court level. They argue it violates the First Amendment for individual workers uh, to have to accept their union's bargaining table advocacy. Interestingly, those lawsuits um, are supported from afar by some worker and union advocates who believe that ending exclusive representation might lead to a multiplicity of unions that have different goals, tactics, and priorities, who would compete for members, right, and trigger this reinvigoration of labor unions through competition. But a couple of caveats about that. First, there's no freestanding right to bargain individually with your public employer over your wages and working conditions. So cases challenging exclusive representation by unions, I don't think it is unfair to say, are essentially arguing that it is a constitutional right to have your wages set unilaterally by your employer. Second, as far as I know, there is no claim that public employers are constitutionally barred from hiring a consultant like Deloitte or McKinsey in order to decide what workers' wages and working conditions ought to be. So the constitutional objection in these exclusive representation cases is essentially that giving workers a voice in choosing SEIU or AFSCME to be across the table from their employer rather than a management consultant right, uh, who is chosen by the employer alone. Third, as a practical matter, it's not clear that the alternative to a public employer bargaining with an exclusive representative is a public employer bargaining with a variety of members-only unions. Right? States are free to decide that they don't want uh, to engage in public sector collective bargaining at all. Many states have done that. Um, public sector collective bargaining is a misdemeanor in a couple of states. Um, states can also sharply cur curtail the scope of collective bargaining, as we saw Wisconsin do back in 2011. And there's reason to believe that states might do this, right? Rather than redrafting their public sector labor law to allow members only bargaining in the face of a decision holding that the exclusive representation system is unconstitutional. Historically, a couple of states, including California, attempted members only bargaining, but they quickly ended those experiments. The only current exception is Tennessee, which allows multiple employee organizations to represent teachers. But key to understanding Tennessee's system is that it is not collective bargaining at all. It is, in fact, something that Tennessee calls collaborative conferencing, uh, which only allows organizations to give input to the governmental employer, which ultimately makes decisions. So the Tennessee example also suggests another dynamic, which is that members-only bargaining will lead to a proliferation of kind of anti-union employee organizations that are funded or controlled. Um, by organizations that have a more fundamental goal of weakening the labor movement rather than getting results for the employees they represent, right? That's happened in Tennessee. There's this anti-union union. So put me down as skeptical, right? Not only of the First Amendment theory that exclusive representation is unconstitutional, but also of the idea that ending exclusive representation would yield positive results, right, for employees or for labor. Alongside cases challenging exclusive representation, um, litigants in a couple of other cases seek to extend Janus by arguing that unions can't condition the right to vote in union affairs or other valuable members-only benefits on union membership. Right now, unions in both the public and private sector limit participation in union democracy to dues-paying union members. And some unions off also offer valuable members-only benefits, which come directly from the union rather than from the employer, and they're not part of any collective bargaining agreement. Some of these benefits are small, right? If you're represented by a union, you can probably get some reduced price movie tickets. Um, but others are fairly valuable, including some supplemental insurance benefits um, that are offered by the California Teachers Association and that many teachers use when they go out on parental leave. So the argument is that these arrangements, both the limiting voting to members and the members-only benefits, are unconstitutional, takes a couple of forms. Um, but it's most kind of distilled variation is that unions shouldn't be able to hold out these benefits as a way to encourage workers to join. Um, these lawsuits would probably use the word coercion rather than encouragement. Uh, and that any worker who's represented by a union should then have a say in that union's leadership. So for this argument to succeed, right, courts would first have to find that the First Amendment is triggered at all, right, that there is state action um, when you are dealing with a relationship between a union, which is a private entity, and individual workers, right, surely a stretch. But also, if courts accept this theory, right, it would extend even further the divergence between how the court treats market leverage in campaign finance cases dealing with corporations and the wealthy, and how it treats market leverage when it's exerted by unions. 
Finally, other cases challenge other state responses that are designated to blunt, uh, that are designed to blunt the impact of Janus. Uh, union objectors are challenging on First Amendment grounds laws that give uh, elected unions an opportunity to meet with new hires, for example. So we'll see how that plays out. So these and similar First Amendment theories uh, threaten the continued viability of public sector collective bargaining as we know it now. Um, and if accepted, would also uh, endanger labor law reform in the private sector, right? So as you may be following, labor law reform is very much a matter of public discussion at the moment. Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that there's an existing First Amendment theory, albeit not one that's already been accepted, uh, that could be invoked to challenge every significant proposal for private sector labor law reform that is currently under consideration. Um, and if accepted, these First Amendment theories could also imperil even existing limits on, for example, what private sector employers can say in opposition to union drives. They could challenge exclusive representation in the public sector, as I said. They could challenge uh, recent state and local innovations concerning so-called alt-labor groups. To be sure, it is conceivable that uh, workers and unions could put these same theories to work themselves in what I call silver lining litigation. For example, in the recent decision in the case Nifla v. Becerra, the court signaled that it was probably unconstitutional for courts to, uh, sorry, for states to require crisis pregnancy centers to post truthful information about their own services and or the availability of low cost abortions elsewhere. One might observe that this rule could also be applied to notices that private sector unions are currently required to send to workers informing them of their right to become agency fee payers. Likewise, some unions are attempting to, lo uh, to leverage the logic of Janus into other contexts. For example, one local union is arguing that their members can't be required to pay taxes that local governments use to hire lobbyists. <laughs> Others argue that Janus, or at least Abood, should apply in the context of uh, public sector pension benefits, many of which are managed by private firms that engage in potentially objectionable political speech. And for good measure, some Oregon lawyers are arguing, for better or worse, that under Janus they should be entitled to stop paying their bar dues. Okay. Let me just say that I am skeptical about these efforts for a few reasons, including that the Supreme Court has demonstrated a willingness to cabin its labor First Amendment cases. For the silver lining strategy to work, I think we'd need a different judiciary. I don't think I need to convince anyone in this audience at this on this particular day that judicial appointments matter, um, but what the heck, I'll repeat it. If we have a different judiciary, though, I think workers and unions should try a different and I think more fundamentally optimistic strategy. Uh, they should seek to resurrect a vision of the First Amendment that is more like the one the court uh, adopted in Austin, right? One that is not blind to the relationship between economic market power and the metaphorical marketplace of ideas. So I was going to try to end on an optimistic note, and I'm not really sure that was it, but... <laughs> It also seems like I've been talking forever, so I'm going to stop here and uh, look forward to hearing your questions. <laughs> and I think there are some people circulating with microphones. Uh, when you were talking about Tennessee, and the non-union unions. Hmm. Um, could you talk about how those are being funded a little bit, if you, if you know that right now? Uh, I am not entirely sure. I mean, so there are two examples of these non-union unions. One is in the Tennessee example. Um, and there's a great article by um, a journalist named Chris Brooks that you might uh, try to, that you might Google. He might have some more details about funding. Uh, the other example is in the private sector. Um, so you might remember a number of years ago, the UAW was running a union organizing campaign at the Volkswagen plant in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So we're just in Tennessee and all over the place. Um, the union lost, but the employer was still interested in hearing from employees and so created this system of, you know, something that seems sort of similar to this collaborative conferencing model. And there too, right, there's the UAW representing, you know, something like 45% of employees, but also something, but also another kind of anti-union organization that I, I think probably has uh, some of the same funders as some of these lawsuits we were talking about, but I don't, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> 
Um, so I wanted to kind of pick up on the optimistic note on which you left off um, and ask just a little bit sort of specific kind of blue sky thinking, that if in, let's say in, in three years, uh, six new justices were appointed to the Supreme Court to create a 10-5 supermajority. <laughs> and of course you'd want to remove in that scenario these fetters on organized labor, right? Like clearly you'd want to remove those things. But you know, I like to think big, and so I like to imagine what are the possible fetters one could place on organized capital, right? In other words, what would an anti-Janus look like? You know, in other words, not returning simply to this sort of abode compromise, but like, are there sort of legitimate First Amendment or other theories that would go like go all the way in the other direction, or would go you know past that to say we're going to use this sort of law in the First Amendment to actually enhance labor power and constrain capital power? Are there things like that? Because that that sounds optimistic. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, there is some 13th Amendment thinking uh, that focuses on the idea that uh, true freedom at work um, includes more than just the ability to quit, that it includes certain constraints on what your employer to, can do to you to make your employment situation oppressive. Um, and so the 13th Amendment might be a place to look. Um, I am skeptical of the idea that we should be advocating for First Amendment theories that would themselves directly constrain capital, but I am certainly all for uh, First Amendment theories that would give legislatures a much freer hand in constraining what unions can do, and especially in conditioning um, corporate charters on certain like actions or non-actions. Thanks for your talk. Um, so I had a quick question about several lawsuits that have been filed around the country about clawbacks. So on the yeah. argument that it's compelled speech that people had to pay agency fees in the past. So can you talk a little bit about that? I can, yeah. So if you ask unions today what are the most threatening um, cases that are follow-ons to Janus, they'll mention these cases, which are cases saying apply the statute of limitations, the applicable statute of limitations under section 1983, we should be able to go back that far. And everybody who paid union dues during that time and everybody who paid agencies during that time ought to be eligible to get their money back. Uh, billions of dollars in liability, a completely existential threat to the American labor movement. Um, the only sort of positive thing I have to say about the likelihood of success in these cases um, is that there were there was a similar set of follow-on cases after Harris v. Quinn, um, and they were not successful for a couple of reasons. Some of them found uh, that there was sort of a good faith defense that applied, which is like qualified immunity but weaker. Um, and others found that an attempt to certify a class that consists of everybody who paid any money to a union um, is not, like, will not meet the requirements of Rule 23 because, of course, some people in the class wanted to pay the money to the union and do not want to have their unions go bankrupt. Um, so I think the class certification theory is actually somewhat more... Um, is somewhat more likely to hold because I think people see that there is sort of an, an opposite ideological valence in um, expanding the scope of Rule 23 to allow more um, large class actions to go forward and refunding union dues. Um, we will see. I mean, you know what I said about my ability to make predictions, so I will <laughs> perhaps decline. Um, but, uh, but the recent historical example is, uh, suggests that those cases will not be successful. Uh, thanks for coming. So I have a, some more questions about the First Amendment. When I read through Kagan's dissent, she says this is speech about collective bargaining, speech involving terms and conditions. Is this really a First Amendment issue at all? When I read through the Janus decision, the majority never really explains why this is speech covered by the First Amendment. So is this really a First Amendment issue as far as these fees go? And if so, are there, are there decisions in this line of cases that really explain why this is a speech issue? No, is the, is the answer um, to all of it. Um, <laughs> so whether compelled subsidization of speech implicates the First Amendment gets a complete kind of drive-by treatment in Abood, and Abood is the foundational case in other cases that 
um, apply the same rule in limited numbers of other contexts. Um, so there uh, is some great work by, I think, Robert Post, and I think Fred Schauer, showing that we engage in compelled subsidization of speech all the time, right? I mean, for example, um, when you lose a lawsuit and you are required to pay the other side's legal fees, um, you are being required to pay for a whole bunch of speech with which you vehemently disagree. Um, and yet, nobody thinks that the First Amendment applies. Um, so we get this line of cases, right? You barred use um, where the rule follows a bood, right? We had a bood. We had a case about student activity fees where the uh, students lost. Um, and like this very small number of situations where we really believe that compelled subsidization of speech is a First Amendment problem and really no um, kind of theoretical explanation of why these cases and not other cases. If we were to take seriously the idea that compelled subsidization of speech implicates the First Amendment, then there are a lot of modern arrangements that we were going to have to undo. Um, so the court in, the majority in Janus sort of blows by that by saying, well, the part of Abu that was right was the part that said that compelled subsidization of speech implicates the First Amendment. Um, and that goes back to these Railway Labor Act cases where, again, the court just says it. Uh, but or actually, the court doesn't say it, right? <laughs> the court just overreads that. Um, and, the, and by the way, those cases got wrong everything else um, because the Railway Labor Act cases were private sector cases, and even though they found that there was state action, um, they applied some sort of like lesser version of the First Amendment because we were dealing with a private sector employer. So the reasoning, like the theoretical basis for this entire line of cases is weak at best. Um, I actually thought that it would have been pretty promising in terms of a doctrinal consistency um, standpoint to situate the union dues cases alongside the other public employee speech cases. Um, at which point you could you would look at whether paying you know, 400, you know, buying $400 worth of union bargaining um, really qualifies as a matter of public concern, which would trigger some which would trigger First Amendment rights for the public employees, more or less. Um, in other cases, right, where in public employees go in and ask their employers for small things, the court says that is not a matter of public concern. Nobody really cares whether the fire chief, you know, gets like two weeks off or not. Um, but in Janus, the court says, well, you don't look at $400 worth of bargaining. You look at the entire scope of bargaining. So nobody cares about the fire chief and his vacation, but people care a lot about whether the entire Medicaid budget will increase or not. Um, and therefore, we kind of impute to the objecting employees $400 the entire scope of that speech and presumably the fact that the employer has agreed to it or not. So I don't know if you can make sense of it, that. I really cannot. Um, but that's sort of where we are. <laughs> Um, you had you had mentioned that the court seems perfectly willing to cabin mm -hmm. corporate First Amendment speech from uh, labor union First Amendment speech, and I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit how, if corporations are thought of as a collection, a collective of shareholders, mm -hmm. but if the court in Citizens United said we're not going to recognize the dissenting shareholders' uh, unwillingness to support the corporation's speech. How is the court able to, to distinguish that from a labor union, which is a collective of workers? How, where is, how are they able to feel consistent about, about those two? So I think if you ask the court, it would say state action, right? I think the, you know, and I'm not saying I necessarily find this a tremendously convincing distinction, but the court would say the relationship between the employer, uh, between a corporation and its shareholders is entirely a private one. Let's ignore how corporate law shapes that relationship. But the relationship between, uh, the relationship that compels employees to pay agency fees is one that is either in law, right, is either in legislation or is in a contract to which a public employer is a party. Um, and that triggers the First Amendment in a way that um, the, sh the corporate shareholder context wouldn't trigger. Should we? Uh, Are we done? Uh, thank you, Professor. Okay.